Hey everyone, Bandit here. The time has finally come. Elden Ring, the next FromSoft title in the Souls series, has been released to us at long last. And if you said it had some new stuff to bring to the table, you'd be making an enormous understatement. It's got an all new universe with vast, in depth lore, an open world setup that gives players the ability to go wherever they please, whenever they want, on horseback, and most importantly, it gave us Sonic Goats. But as is common with all FromSoft games, and especially with Elden Ring, the player wandering around the merciless world of bloodthirsty monsters might begin to think to themselves, why am I doing any of this? What the hell is actually going on here? Only to be met with answers that are either much too vague to be proper answers or ones that do nothing but lead to other questions entirely. Because of FromSoft's super vague storytelling style, I've decided to explain the characters in depth one by one, starting with the very top. Queen Marika, the ruler of the Lands Between and Shatterer of the Elden Ring, which ironically is also one of the most confusing characters to understand in the entire game. But rest assured, I will be explaining things in a way that anyone, and I mean anyone, can fully understand. So no worries about talking over anyone's head. Oh, by the way, this video will spoil the ending of the game, as well as lots of other stuff about other characters, since Marika is connected to them all, let's just say. You've been warned. Long before the events of the game started, and our player Tarnished woke up from their slumber, Merrick rose to power in the lands between and became its ruler and literal vessel for the Elden Ring. But first, let's define what all these things mean so that everyone's on the same page regarding the setup of the world. The Elden Ring physically is a combined set of runes, called Great Runes, that anyone can see upon loading the game. It's right there, in the menu. That is literally the Elden Ring. Meta physically though, the Elden Ring is the most powerful object in the realm. But what does that really mean? Basically, the world of of the Lands Between has its set of rules within which everything operates, and these rules are set by the runes that exist within the Elden Ring. For example, the Elden Ring has the runes of order, life, and death, meaning all three of these concepts exist and are enforced within the Lands Between. If you were to remove the rune of death from the Elden Ring, then death itself would no longer exist in the Lands Between, which actually happens, but more on that later. The outer god that created the Elden Ring is called the Greater Will, and it is responsible for basking the lands between with its golden light of grace, and offering you, the tarnished player character, with a blessing of grace in order to come back to life and return to the lands between in hopes of becoming the next Elden Lord. The Greater Will is more of a concept than a god in regular terms, but it does seem to be sentient and able to choose its own will, since it can freely offer its grace to whoever it wants, and it can choose a worthy individual to become the vessel of the Elden Ring, and rule the lands between. Which brings us back to Queen Merica the Eternal who was chosen by the Greater Will to become the Elden Ring's vessel an unknown amount of time ago. Before becoming the Golden Ruler, it's probable that Merica came from a land outside of the Lands Between, since we can read from her weapon's item description that her hammer came from the lands of Numen, outside the Lands Between. Either way, once she was a resident of the Lands Between, she rose to power quickly and was chosen by the Greater Will because she exuded the three traits necessary for becoming the ruler as per the Greater Will's requirements. One, she was an Empyrean, which is a very specific race of people that must have been born from only one god. Not two gods, not one god and one human, and not two humans. That just makes other humans. And since being born of a single god requires that god to be able to self-fertilize somehow, you could imagine that this is quite rare. Meaning Merica was already a cut above the rest as far as a ruler candidate is concerned. The second qualification is that a ruler should have a shadow, or a protector, who in Merica's case was her half-brother, a half-wolf individual known as Malekith. And third, Third, a ruler must have a consort, which Merica had. The man known as Godfrey was her husband and willing partner with which she could and did bear several children. Oh, and by the way, the consort of the ruler, aka the Elden Ring's vessel, receives the title of Elden Lord, which is why Godfrey is the first Elden Lord, being Merica's husband. Anyway, having passed all the qualifications for ruler, the Greater Will chose Merica, and she then became Queen Merica, ruler of the lands between and literal vessel for the Elden Ring. And as queen, it wasn't long before she started popping out some royal kids with her hubby Godfrey. Their firstborn was named Godwin. Then they had the Omen twins, Morgoth aka Margot, and Moog aka Mogwin. And finally, their runt of the litter named Godric. These half-god, half-man children were the first demigods. And since they were born not of only Merica, but of Merica and Godfrey, they were not Empyrean and therefore not able to ever succeed their mother as the next ruler of the land. After Merica got tired of being 
pregnant back to back to back, we find out that her true goals were much more selfish than you would expect from a queen or even a mother. Her first questionable action as queen was to sever the Elden Ring, which as a reminder is her, by the way, by removing the rune of death like I alluded to earlier. As you could expect, this removed death from the world, but more importantly, from herself, granting her the title of Queen America the Eternal. But after removing the rune, she did not destroy it, but instead gave it to her half-brother Shadow Maliketh for safekeeping in order to control death instead of succumb to it. Pretty crafty. Now at this point I've got to pause on Merica's story and explain one other extremely important lore detail, and that is that Merica has a special ability. The ability to split into two different individuals. Herself, Merica, the female part, and Radagon, the male part. Yep, they are actually one and the same, proven multiple times in the game with the direct statement from the shape-shifting statue and also visually when we get to see Merica turn into Radagon in the ending fight in front of our eyes. So to talk about Merica means you also have to talk about Radagon. Now it's unknown if she already had this ability as an Empyrean or if she was granted it after becoming a god aka the vessel of the Elden Ring, but personally I suspect it's the latter and here's my theory as to why. Remember that Merica literally is the Elden Ring, so splitting the ring into shards would mean splitting herself and these shards are normally represented visually in game as the great runes. And later on in her story, after she shatters the Elden Ring entirely, we also see the other shards as the other great runes that we acquire after defeating the demigods. And if you combine each of these great runes that Merica split apart from the whole, they do indeed all fit back together to form the completed Elden Ring. Except for one piece in particular. That crisscross looking pattern that seemingly connects all the other pieces is missing, even after piecing everything together. Interestingly enough, when looking at Radagon statues like this one in the Bellum Church, not only do we notice Radagon's extreme similarities to Merica minus the boobs of course, but we can also see that he is positioned in front of the missing piece of the Elden Ring, the great rune that features that crisscross pattern of a bunch of X's. I believe this proves to us that similar to how Merica doesn't just possess the Elden Ring but literally is the Elden Ring, Radagon doesn't just possess a shard of the Elden Ring but rather is literally a great rune that Merica split apart from herself, complete with his own body and personality as proven to us by the fact that Merica's hammer tells us that Merica shattered the Elden Ring but Radagon attempted to repair it, proving they have different consciousnesses. Confused? Great, let's keep going. The question is why did Merica split Radagon apart from herself? Well, once Merica was queen of the land and after making herself immortal, she began to wage wars. And I believe she split Radagon into his own being in order to have herself serve herself as the head of her host of armies, which is said was the entire purpose behind Radagon's appearance in the lands between. The first war that Merica waged was with the fire giants of the north, who were in service to another god that granted them their powers. Can't have that of course, so Merica and her hubby Godfrey and her armies led by Radagon went up there and killed their god. The fire giants, who all had flaming red hair and were pissed at the whole losing their god thing, in turn cursed Radagon, a curse that resulted in Radagon having red hair. Previously Radagon had golden hair just like Merica, so apparently this pissed him off. Merica then cursed the fire giants right back with making them forever tend to their flames, which is apparently a bad thing. Anyway, there were still other giants to clear up including their leader, but at this point Merica sent Radigan and her host of armies back down to the south to fight against the Carrion royal family, who were a group of people that, similarly to the fire giants, worshipped the moon and saw it as equal to the stars. The robes proved to us that their belief in the moon was heralded as heresy, so of course Merica can't have that. Radigan and the golden host warred against the head of both the Carrion royal family and the academy of Raya Lucaria, a woman by the name of Renala, queen of the full moon. According to the description of one of the royal Carrion knight swords, apparently even though Renala's forces were much smaller in size than the golden host, they still proved a match through sorcerous battle skills. But in a twist of fate that nobody saw coming, Radagon, who was fighting against Renala, instead stops fighting her and falls in love with her and then marries her. Strangely enough, even though Radagon is born of the Elden Ring and therefore exists as an embodiment of the moon's opposition, given that his other half Merica heralded all this stuff as heresy, he himself was pretty open-minded. As husband to Renala, he actually studied her sorcery, moon magic, and as husband to Merica, which is something we'll get to in a second, he studied her incantations. After they were married, Radagon just moved on in with Renala and lived in the academy, which is why his wolf is still there when the player Tarn
Garnished is exploring the area. While living with his new wife Renala, and while his other self is waging a war with the giants in the north, Radagon just decides to get busy and starts having kids with Renala. Together they make the following babies. Radon, who grew up to be General Radon, who was visually designed to resemble Ganondorf, which I think is super cool, Rykard, an absolute weirdo, and Ronnie the Witch. Although, she calls herself an Empyrean while Radon and Rykard are not, so her being born of Renala is currently still debatable. After Renala's children are born, Merica in the meantime finally has Godfrey kill the giant Stormlord, and right after that she removes his grace from him and banishes him from the lands between to become the first Tarnished, which is like super oh. harsh, especially since Godfrey the first Elden Lord clearly only loved and served his wife Merica and ended up getting banished for doing his job, but I think she did this because not only had he served his purpose, but she also found out that Radagon, her other self, could also produce children, meaning she didn't need Godfrey or anyone else to produce a worthy heir in case anything were to happen to her. Her real lover was herself all along. And once Radigan heard of Godfrey's banishment, he up and leaves his family and Renala in order to go make babies with himself. Herself themselves. I don't know, it's kind of weird. It is said that Renala's heart left with him, meaning she was understandably heartbroken. But it's okay, because Radagan made a new great rune, one of unborn children that exists in the form of an egg, and gave it to her. Cause that fixes everything. Spoiler alert, it doesn't and she still can't get over him to this day. Anyway, when Radagon returned to Merica and became Elden Lord number two, they married themselves and got busy pretty quickly and popped out a pair of beautiful little baby twins named Michaela and Millennia, one of which you probably recognize from this extremely cool trailer scene, and who both unfortunately were born with some pretty bad defects like being an eternal child in Michaela's case or having rot inside your body in Millennia's case, which could be because they were in bread? Maybe? It's not explained why, but what's special about these two is that since they are born of only one god, they are Merica's first Empyrean offspring. Besides Rani, that is, but like I said, her birth is another theory in and of itself. Speaking of Rani though, after many years pass and the young witch girl ages to at least semi-adulthood, she's randomly chosen by the two fingers, which are the speakers of the greater will, to be groomed into replacing Merica as the new vessel of the Elden Ring. Because even though Merica is supposed supposed to be eternal at this point, apparently the Greater Will had other plans. The thing is, Rani isn't so keen about the Greater Will or its Golden Order, and she decides she actually wants nothing to do with it. But she also knew that with her immortal Empyrean flesh, she would never be able to escape the pressuring of the Greater Will, exerting its will over her will, so she decides to prevent it in a very dramatic way, by literally committing suicide with the Rune of Death. So she learned of where it was, and she stole it from Malachi and used it to craft black knives from the death rune. And on the night of the black knives, she had herself killed, releasing her soul from her body, which is why she now inhabits the body of a doll instead. Now, what does this have to do with Merica, I hear you wondering? Well, it just so happens that on that night, the night of the black knives, another demigod was also killed, Godwin. Remember Godwin, Merica and Godfrey's firstborn son and all around good guy, and subsequently Merica's favorite was murdered. But for some reason, instead Instead of his body being killed and his soul released, his soul was killed and his body was released. Which leads to all sorts of other events that I don't have time to go to in this video. It's unknown if Rani ordered the murder of Godwin since she's the one who made the Black Knives and it happened on the same night under her command at least in part, or if the Black Knife assassins did it of their own volition. But again, I'm not going to delve into too much non merica lore since that would make this video much, much longer. Anyway, Merica becomes quite upset at the murder of her favorite child and also at the death of Rani, who was the only whole, non-tainted child of hers that could possibly succeed her after her reign was over. Now you might be wondering, why should she be worried about a successor if she herself is eternal? Like I was mentioning earlier, this isn't answered directly, but I personally believe that since the Two Fingers aka the Greater Will was trying to groom Rani into becoming the next vessel of the Elden Ring, it can be assumed that it was none other than the Greater Will itself who was going to enforce the end of Merica's reign. Remember that the Greater Will never intended on death being separated from life. That was a Merica thing. So either the Greater Will was now of the opinion that Merica should be dead at this point, or it just had a problem with her and no longer believed she was fit to rule, thus attempting to groom Rani as Merica's replacement. So to revolt against the will of the Greater Will and remain the ruler forever, Merica then shatters the Elden Ring, bringing absolute chaos to the world and shattering her own body in the process. Now it's pretty obvious that Merica and the Greater Will are not aligned with one another 
another, and given Merica's selfish actions with repeatedly altering the Elden Ring to her own desires and some very ominous information that we can read from Gideon's armor, which says that when he saw Merica's true will, he shuddered in fear at the end which should not be. Clearly, Merica had something terrifying in mind for the land of the lands between and its people within. Although, what it was specifically, we can't presently determine without extreme jumps of speculation. At this point, Radigan, who is known as Radigan of the Golden Order, by the way, and who was born of the Elden Ring with a mind of his own that is allied with the Greater Will, in contrast to Merica, reforges himself back into the Elden Ring, back into Merica's body. Doing this returned his shard to the ring and restored some order to the world, preventing its absolute collapse, leading me to believe that Radigan of the Golden Order may have possessed the Great Rune of Order, the crisscross pattern that connected all the others. After this, for the rest of the story, both Merica and Radigan exist within the same body. With the other shards scattered and resting with Merica's non-Empyrean demigod children, the Greater Will had no choice but to keep her as the Elden Ring's vessel, for the foreseeable future, because it's not like they have a bunch of potential Empyrean replacements. After Radigan's re-merging with the Elden Ring, aka Merica, therefore removing the second Elden Lord from existence, the Greater Will began to get desperate for someone to do something about repairing the shards of the Elden Ring, and it's at this point that the Greater Will itself extends its grace to the Tarnished, which includes you, the player. The events of the game follow, which in a nutshell is summed up by saying the player Tarnished reclaims all of the shards of the Elden Ring by killing all of Merica's demigod children and ends the game by repairing the Elden Ring, aka Merica, and ruling alongside the imprisoned god as the Elden Lord. There are other optional endings which mostly include adding different runes to the repaired Elden Ring in order to alter the way the world will work for the next dozen millennia or so, but one other optional ending actually does away with Merica and the Elden Ring for good, and it all revolves around Rani the Witch, ushering in the Era of Moonlight. But that's something I'll cover in a separate video since this one is already way too long, so be sure to let me know in the comments below whether or not you'd like to see Rani's story explained by yours truly. And that wraps up the story of Merica, complete from start to finish. But with a game as vast as Elden Ring, it is possible that I forgot something or maybe missed a piece of lore that could have changed my outcome. If you know of anything like this, I'd love to read about it in the comments below. Also, thank you so much for watching. I've been wanting to talk about Elden Ring for so long on the channel and it feels so good to finally have officially begun covering this game. This video required lots of hours of research, so please consider leaving a like if you enjoyed the video as it really helps it out on the algorithm. And subscribe if you haven't already to stick around for all the other videos to come. Huge thanks as always to my bandit crew, who make my day every day, and that's about it. Hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day and that you continue to enjoy the spectacle that is Elden Ring. Game of the year 2022, calling it right now. Anyway, this is Bandit, looking forward to seeing you next time and signing out. Peace!